consensus. With plate tectonics, for example, and continental drift, there was little consensus until uh, the mid-1960s when there was a convergence of evidence and it became so obvious that this had to be going on and there was like six different lines of evidence that all pointed to one conclusion. I always look for, David, that, that sort of convergence of evidence in which the the outsiders are picking at one little thing, ignoring this mass body of evidence that points to this one conclusion. All right, right here. Uh, my name is Inlay. I come from India. Uh, as far as I understand, science is self-corrective and never claimed perfection. Whereas all religions that depend upon the holy books like Quran, Bible, Vedas, they claim perfection and the name intelligent design is nothing but camouflage of God. So whatever you say, uh, with the sweeping remarks and without any humble nature, which science claims, uh, I think is not uh, standing. And to teach intelligent design to students is uh, making a very harmful thing uh, in future and also in the past. Well, I've already said that I think it's premature to teach intelligent, intelligent design in science classes. I do, however, however, think that Darwinism should not be taught uh, uncritically. Uh, in fact, uh, I agree with you that science is tentative, but uh, many of the classes I've attended or other people I know have attended about Darwinism are anything but tentative. So I think there's a problem there. <clears throat> okay, in the back. Uh, I have a question for both of you. First, for Dr. Shermer, you said that we had to keep searching until we find a bottom-up explanation, and I want to ask why. I mean, what if the truth about the universe isn't that there's a bottom-up explana bottom bottom -up explanation for some things, or maybe all things? And uh, secondly, for Dr. Wells, what do you have to say to the co-option argument that, if you could remind us of what that is, and that Dr. Shermer made, and what do you have to say about that? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, first, in general, uh, when we talk about the philosophical underpinnings of science, that we look for natural explanations. It's not that there's some rule that we all adhere by or there's some science czar that says you can't do otherwise. It's that there's nothing to do with non-natural explanations. There's no way to test them. Uh, let, let's take a, a less controversial subject. Well, maybe not. But anyway, psychic power, you know, people believe that, you know, we can read each other's thoughts. Okay, well, you know, I'm skeptical of this, uh, that there's even anything to explain. But let's say, actually, there was something to explain. There was some statistically significant tests, and turns out some people really can read other people's minds. And, and, and then somebody discovered a theory about it. That, uh, that in fact, and this isn't a legitimate theory, that at the quantum level, there's certain uncertainty states inside these little microtubules inside the neurons, and, and, and in those little sort of vacuumed, uh, uh, vacuum states, that there's a certain level of uncertainty that causes neurons to fire randomly, or in certain patterns, if we all think collectively about a certain thought like peace or ending the war in Iraq or something like this, and it all directed. Let's say somebody actually discovers that there is some interaction between at the, uh, quantum mechanics and, and, and neuroscience, and we now have a legitimate theory. All right? The paranormal has just disappeared. We've just debunked the paranormal. We now have a perfectly natural explanation for how people can read each other's thoughts. That's the ultimate fate of the paranormal and the supernatural. It's just gone when science comes up with an explanation. So it, it's just the way it is. It's not that anybody says it has to be that way. And the, the co-option question, uh, the co-option idea is that something that may have evolved for one purpose is then later co-opted for another purpose. Uh, Mr. Shermer used the example of wings, uh, feathers actually, proto-feathers. Uh, the current hypothesis is that wings evolved, birds evolved, that is, from theropod dinosaurs. Well, a theropod dinosaurs built something like a T-Rex, only smaller. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park or been to a museum, these are animals with big, heavy hindquarters and tiny little for forward limbs, front limbs. And somehow, the idea of co-option is that they sprouted proto-feathers, which were like hairs, and then somehow natural selection evolved these feathers, co-opted these proto-feathers and these mini forward limbs uh, to turn them into wings. Well, I find that an argument from, if you will, credulity. 
Uh, we've, uh, we skeptics have been accused of the argument from incredulity. I think that's an argument from credulity. It's just totally implausible. So where do you so think co-option? I don't pretend to know, but I don't say that we have an answer, and the answer is co-option. It just doesn't work. Michael, the Washington Post reported yesterday that 30 percent of Americans believe the Bush administration raised gas prices earlier so they could then cause them to drift down <laughs> toward election day. Have you investigated this no, hypothesis? No, I have not, but that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> Actually, my taxi, di taxi driver yesterday in New York did mention that now that he's said that. <laughs> it apparently is widespread. Uh, yes, right here. First, I just have to mention that your description of all theropods there was massively wrong. So you might want to check into that. But my question is, um, specifically, you had attacked naturalism as a methodology for science at the end of your discussion. If we have this, whether you want to use the word or not, godlike designer out there, why do you limit your attack on naturalism just to biology? Why doesn't the Discovery Institute, when they're studying traffic in Seattle, look for an intelligent designer causing traffic jams or my accountant why where is this intelligent designer in every other field of endeavor well i think the discovery institute is advocating intelligent design of traffic right <laughs> <laughs> yeah not not very successfully so far but uh, seattle has a terrible problem and actually the largest project at discovery institute is working on that but uh, your your question is legitimate uh, and uh, I would say that uh, science, some people say science is limited to testing natural explanations, which is actually a limit on science, mm -hmm. which leaves beyond science all those other things that may in fact be real, but science can't get at with its method. Mr. Shermer in his book did not define science as a limit on method, but a limit on reality. There is no supernatural. Once you adopt that definition of science, you're actually using applied materialistic philosophy to explain the world. And the evidence, ultimately, is just window dressing. And that's my complaint with Darwinism, because I see Darwinism doing that. But that wasn't my question. I got off on the traffic, I guess. <laughs> Repeat your question, maybe? Where is the designer in every other field of human endeavor? What else is he doing? Well, I, I would say we'd have to take it case by case. Uh, actually, intelligent design is not limited to biology. Uh, there's a book called The Privileged Planet that Discovery Institute uh, fellows put out, uh, arguing that the cosmos is designed. And it gives uh, lengthy arguments and evidence for that. Uh, so it's not limited to biology. Uh, maybe traffic in Seattle could use some intelligent design. At this point, I would say there's not much evidence for it. Right there. Yeah. Uh, my name is Philip Collier. I'm a freelance writer, and like your moderator, I do not have a PhD. Um, one thing I was thinking about, and this seems to me a difficulty. Speak with, up a little. This seems to be a difficulty with intelligent design. It would be this: I would like to propose my own intelligent design theory, which is the entire universe and everything we have was created one month ago. And all our memories and all our books and everything we read and everything we know was created one month ago. And if I started an institute, I could call it the one month ago institute, and I have to call it the two month ago institute a month, I would say that the thing about my theory is that I think it's a reasonably valid theory. But the thing about it, which I say it is not scientific, is if a bunch of people believe this, like I propose to do, how could you prove us wrong? What evidence facts could you show us could prove us wrong? It seems to me the fundamental thesis for any scientific theory is they would posit something and say, well, if you can show this, that's why it's wrong. And I would ask Mr. Wells, what facts or evidence would prove you wrong? And if they w would not, if you can't think of anything to prove you wrong, can you tell me what would prove my design theory wrong? Well, in fact, uh, intelligent design in a given case can be proven wrong. Uh, the work of William Dembski, one of the, the main uh, theorists in intelligent design, uh, is that we basically operate in our daily lives using three modes of explanation. One is we can attribute something to natural law, natural regularities, the formation of a crystal, the, uh, the ripples of, of, of sand in, in the sand on the beach or something. 